On behalf of all of the good people who will grace this stage this evening, um, thank you for your commitment, optimism, and courage on all things walrus. You confirm what can be done when a good person is generous with their time, their talent, and their tenacity. Now, I, I have spent uh, most of my life trying to understand the complex relationships between the human family and the natural world. The deep blue sea has been my classroom and my research lab. Along the way, I have had the good fortune to participate in some 60 science and engineering projects beneath the Atlantic, Pacific, and Arctic oceans. Ten years ago, I started studying leadership in life-threatening environments and how it might help us navigate global challenges. Now, when you work deep beneath the ocean, you need four big-ticket items. A $100 million oceanographic research ship, a $20 million extreme depth research sub that will carry three people to 20,000 feet, a really smart uh, sub-pilot, and a science program focusing on the biology and geology of the deep ocean. When you are two, three, four kilometers below the surface of any ocean, there are physical forces that can kill you in an instant. They include freezing cold water, unknown currents, and pressures that bend steel. This is a place where there is no oxygen to breathe. This is a place where leadership means the difference between life and death. Let me give you just one example. Not long ago, I was working with the Russian Academy of Sciences in the North Atlantic, north of the Azores. We were on the Academic Keldish, the world's largest oceanographic research ship, using two $20 million Mir subs to dive into a narrow, steep-walled canyon to collect geological samples. The canyon was 5,000 meters deep. That's three miles. It was five times deeper than two subs had ever been before. On one of those dives, my sub-pilot was Anatoly Sagalovich, a Russian marine engineer and co-designer of the sub. My crewmate was Emery Kristoff, an acclaimed photographer from National Geographic. Imagine three people jammed into the front seat of a compact car, surrounded by dials and gauges, switches and screens. The place smells of processed oxygen and working sweat. It took us four hours to get to the bottom of this canyon. And I can remember drifting down through the ocean, looking out this small viewport just ahead of me, into this universe of impossible blackness with these flashes of bioluminescent life. And I also remember that as we descended, the crew cabin, made of steel, began to shudder with the increasing pressure. Confession. When it comes to this kind of pressure, these kinds of depth, I am an alpha coward. I have a PhD in fear. We get down to 4,500 meters, and a sudden current shifts the sub sideways, and we slam into the canyon wall. There is the sound of steel on stone. The lights went out. The sub tilted back, and I thought I could smell something burning. It was the first time in my life that I discovered that my heart can stop and I can still function. <laughs> my big concern was that the impact had torn away a through hull fitting and that the whole Atlantic Ocean was going to come screaming into that crew cabin and turn the three of us into pink slurry. In the darkness, I could sense Anatoly Sigalovich working on the electrical system. I pushed back my panic and worked on the oxygen system. Kristoff checked the communication system. Now, Emery Kristoff and I are old friends, and we have dived in some very tight places before, underneath the ice of the North Pole, for example. And I know that if things go terribly wrong, that Emery Kristoff is going to help save my life. And he, bless him, believes that the reciprocal is true. 
And we're in the midst of this chaos in the darkness, and Christoph Emery leans into my ear and says, Doc, don't you worry. If that through hole fitting lets go, the only thing you're going to feel is my footprint on your forehead trying to get out of here. <laughs> it was the best thing he could have said to me. My anxiety level was rising into the stratosphere. I was on the edge of a Category 5 panic. And Christoph, in his own way, was saying that he was as frightened as I was and that to get out of this jam, we had to focus on the fundamentals, the checklist. 30 minutes later, we backed the sub. It was the longest year and a half of my life. Uh, 30 minutes later, we backed the sub away from the cliff, got the lights back on, called in the second sub, uh, to check our uh, hull. They looked at it. They said we were okay. And for reasons that I'm sure you understand, we decided to continue the dive. <laughs> now, we survived because we needed and trusted each other. We survived because two guys in the crew cabin had a special form of leadership. Central to it was their empathy, eloquence, and endurance. So Galovich had a blood-deep empathy for his team, for his task, for his technology, and for the underwater terrain. Christoph had a hard-won eloquence in his words and his actions. And both men had a physical and mental resilience that was uh, the foundation of their endurance. Now, when, when you spend time deep inside the ocean, you... You think hard about the relationship between water and leadership. Water, in all its many forms, is the planet's oldest and most essential ecosystem. Leadership, in all its many forms, is the human family's most essential social skill. This evening is going to confirm that the future of water on this planet depends very much on our personal, professional, political, and scientific leadership. For 200 years, we have changed the way water moves around this planet. Think massive dams, flash floods, rising sea levels. There's too much water in some places and not enough water in others. For 200 years, we have changed the very nature of water itself. Water now contains every toxin created by humanity. The good news is that there are some wonderful individuals using their leadership skills to protect and preserve water. They're applying their empathy, their eloquence, their endurance on behalf of the miracle mo molecule. They are the voices of water, and eight of them will speak to you tonight. We, we should listen with our heads and with our hearts to what they say. They're going to tell us that water is the gift of life. They're going to tell us that water is alive. They're going to give us good, solid ideas, positive actions that we can take. We should be aware of the struggle they face to find the right people for their teams, to find enough money for their projects. We should absorb the wonder and wisdom in their words. And because they fight on our behalf, we should support their work. Thank you, Shelley. It's been a pleasure speaking to you.